Most people don't give their brain health the attention it actually needs until it's too late. If you live to 85, you have a 50-50 chance of developing dementia. That's the flip of a coin. So how can you start looking after your brain now to avoid disorders like dementia? Well, today I talked to a functional medicine practitioner, Dr. Sarah Davies, about the huge benefits of functional medicine for your brain, which uses lifestyle prevention rather than pills to treat disorders like dementia, multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's that conventional medicine has written off as untreatable. Hello, I'm neuroscientist Dr. Ben Webb, sharing brain advice for a mentally healthy and happy midlife. Welcome to episode 75 of Better Brain, Better You. Hello, how are you? Thanks so much for joining me for today's episode on the benefits of functional medicine for your brain with Dr. Sarah Davies. But before we jump in to the conversation with Dr. Davies, I want to invite you to join me for a free masterclass on how to prevent dementia. This three part masterclass called How to Rewire Your Brain to Prevent Dementia starts today on the 18th of January. So it's not too late to join. And most people think of dementia as an inevitable part of getting older, but a wave of brain health science research over the past 15 years has revealed that dementia is not a natural part of getting older and has shown us a clear path for how to protect ourselves against this debilitating condition. So in this masterclass, I want to break down why Alzheimer's disease is not an inevitable part of getting older, how you can reduce your risk of getting dementia, and the six pillars of brain health that prevent dementia. So you can register for this free online masterclass at ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash masterclass. That's ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash masterclass. I look forward to seeing you inside the masterclass today. So let's jump in to a really interesting and wide ranging discussion with Dr. Sarah Davies about the huge benefits of functional medicine for your brain. Okay, so welcome to the podcast, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Lovely to meet you. So you, you, you worked as an NHS doctor in general practice for about 18 years, I think that's correct. And, you, and, and you've moved into, so you've set up your own private, clinical, private clinic offering functional medicine. So what was your motivation for training in functional medicine and, and use this, using this approach in your clinical work? So... I think the the primary reason for doing the retraining uh, was that I realised quite soon in my career as a GP that I didn't have a toolkit for dealing with certain kinds of patients. So um, a lot of what we're taught uh, as GPs in Western medicine, you'll know this as well, is is geared towards acute medicine. So our system is built really, really well for dealing with acute infections, strokes, heart attacks. Um, you know, we're really good at saving people's lives in an acute situation. But the medicine that we learn is not quite so good at learning how to keep people well. So we don't learn a lot about prevention because, uh, to be honest, in general practice at the moment, there's not a lot of time for that kind of uh, preventative medicine. And the other area that I found really frustrating for, uh, as a GP was not being able to help people with chronic illness that wasn't well defined or that uh, so things like chronic fatigue and autoimmune diseases and what I noticed actually learning from patients in general practice was that patients themselves often found better ways of managing their illness than I had to offer them uh, in terms of a gen being a general practitioner myself so whereas we kind of are trained to reach for the prescription pad and give people pills for whatever they might present to us with uh, and largely that's that's our toolkit in general practice that's really not appropriate for people with chronic fatiguing illness it doesn't work very well for people with sort of chronic pain um, for whom you don't really want them to just go on to loads of painkillers and I did lots of research myself I'm quite interested in sort of learning how to I was in, interested in 
learning how to help these patients and came across um, learning about nutrition, learning more about functional medicine, learning about um, how changes in diet could really, really help people with, say, chronic fatigue syndrome. So I I met a patient who um, took milk out of her diet and went from being wheelchair bound to having a normal life again. Now, I wish it was that simple with 99% of, of chronic fatigue patients. But even if that approach of changing diet could make a change in a tiny percentage of the chronic fatigue patients that we met, that we meet, that would be incredible. Uh, and for me, just learning that these things could make a difference, but then no one else being interested made me go looking for other people who, who sh- kind of shared this passion and shared this interest in helping people that by and large, because we don't have a toolkit to help them in general practice, get written off and left to their own devices. Um, and I came across an Institute for Functional Medicine. I had a colleague at the time who was an anaesthetist. And she said, look at this course. They've brought it to London from the, the States. And, and we went on the course and the, the rest is history. So I think it was 2015. Um, and I set up uh, my own um, private clinic the year after, after starting the training. So I did a lot of research by myself and I started using um, dietary medicine specifically and some nutrition in general practice. And then after I'd had this training, I felt like, well, this is the medicine that I wanted to do. So I just got on with it and set up my clinic. So we've been going just over six years now. Um, And I have been amazed by what this new toolbox that I have learned from functional medicine has given me the capacity to help people with um, a toolbox that I never imagined would be available to me, you know, when I trained as a GP. Wow, that's amazing. So is it fair to say then that, so the kind of, you know, traditional medicine as we know it, going to see our GP, going going to the hospital, they're kind of, their toolkit, you know, a, a lot of the time, you know, is as you say, prescription, drugs and so on, and off, often trying to manage the symptoms rather than necessarily the underlying causes, whereas functional medicine, a, a lot of the time you try to drill down and particularly with more complex disorders, where a single pill isn't going to isn't going to help to the to the underlying causes, and then build your treatments around those. Exactly. So root cause medicine is the the key to practicing as a, as a functional medicine practitioner. And, and what I've learned is that the the testing kits that we have in general practice uh, are not detailed enough they don't drill down enough into why people become unwell and that's why the vast majority of of, say patients with chronic fatigue I'm just using them as kind of an example uh, will be told that there's nothing wrong with them so that when they have their blood test and there's nothing wrong and these poor people go through life almost believing that it's in their head and that there's nothing sort of physiologically awry and if you start using some of these more advanced you know, scientifically based tests, especially looking around nutrition, around metabolism. So really sort of deep look at how are nutrients being used within the body rather than just how much of a, a nutrient is, is in the bloodstream. And if you start looking at how the thyroid hormones, say, are being metabolized within the body rather than just what the TSH level is, if you start um looking at whether there are toxins at play you suddenly see this world open up where you can see things that are wrong with people Uh, and I was just speaking with one of my colleagues uh, Alex Davidson who started working with me a few months ago uh, and she was telling me that this patient had come back to her with these awful test results and she was just crying with relief because she was so happy that we'd found all these things that were wrong with her because she'd kind of come to believe that it was in her head and that that no one was ever going to believe her that there was something wrong. And for a lot of these patients, it is really not feeling believed. Uh, And there are a lot of doctors still out there now who I don't think believe that chronic fatigue syndrome um, is a a valid or real illness. Uh, And and I think that that's that's a huge problem for these patients in terms of the way that they're treated um, and, and the lack of respect they get say when they get admitted to hospital sometimes the horror stories that we hear because of the complete lack of understanding from um, medical staff who don't understand the root causes behind these illnesses and it's only once you start to understand 
what's going on underneath that you can start to think about how these patients might be helped and the answer is almost always not a pill the answer is almost always unpicking everything unpicking everything from first principles so there are a few pills that we do use in functional medicine but they're really few and far between so we use some high dose uh, micronutrients sometimes especially b12 injections can be helpful in some patients we would use occasionally uh, a drug called low dose naltrexone which at high doses as a doctor you might know it kind of it's used to help people with opiate or addiction problems um, to come away from their opiates or whatever else is going on. I think it's used for alcohol sometimes. But we use it in tiny, tiny doses where it has a different biochemical effect and it actually helps to switch off autoimmunity. In about, I think about a third of patients that we use it on, it has a really, really a profound clinical effect. So we've found that that's another useful pill. Um, and, and we will also, I've got a consultant endocrinologist who works with me, Dr. La Rosa, so we'll also look at using not only levothyroxine, uh, thyroid replacement hormone, but also um, sometimes combinations with liothyronine, which is the active thyroid hormone. Um, and then very occasionally we prescribe antibiotic therapy to our patients if they've got very, very disorganized microbiome or specific infections of the upper digestive tract. We call it um, SIBO. Um, but apart from those those pills, most of what we do is around diet. I work with a team of nutritional therapists um, and there is not one diet that's right for everybody. So it's really, really fine tuning the diet that is right for that person. And we do extensive nutritional testing. And what we do is correct all the imbalances that we can find. And then the body is so intelligent and it's able to start healing itself. And so... The, the kind of way that we work looks very similar for most patients. So the way that we start in terms of our treatment plans looks similar, but the end result and the, the actual fine tuning of the treatment plan will actually be really, really different from patient to patient. So it's not protocol driven. Sometimes I see protocol driven functional medicine. And I think that is if you don't have enough information about a patient, you could start a protocol. But what we tend to do is really try and understand exactly what it is we're dealing with so that our treatment plan is very, very bespoke. So it's very it's pers personalized medicine, so precision medicine. Yeah, precision medicine. And, you know, there's still a lot that we don't know, but but it's it's getting so much better. And my ability to kind of help people with the aid of, of kind of these precision tools um, is is so much better than than what I have in terms of general practice. Plus, I have a long time with patients to understand everything. As a general practitioner, I have ten minutes. As a functional medicine practitioner, so my first appointment will be sixty to ninety minutes, and the patient gets as long as they need. And you try and hang everything together. You see these patients, and they've got maybe five consultants. So they've got skin problems, and they've got like joint problems, and they've got problems with their gut, and they've got other issues. And actually, the driving forces behind the inflammation in the skin and the inflammation in the in the joints and the fatigue is actually a very very has a similar underlying cause. And if you go for the cause, then all the symptoms get better, which is a really cool uh, outcome. Uh, it's very satisfying. So this, personally for me, this is really satisfying medicine to practice, and it gives me great joy to 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 work in functional medicine. Absolutely amazing. So I was just thinking that you, how you're sort of guided. You know, this is a bit of a kind of scientific question, but in the sense of that, so you know, traditional medicine is typically is guided by clinical trials. You know, efficacy, all of that stuff, like you know, and and and, and, the, and the, you know, and recommendations for kind of dosage and so on. So. Are you guided, you know, you're, you're, you're tailoring completely your sort of approach to the kind of individual test results and circumstances of the individual. So is it that guided that way and then trying to get their, you know, hormonal levels or nutritional levels or whatever it might be back, back, back within the normal range? Yeah. Very much so. So, so it's about, so you, you guide, use tests to guide you and then you watch them improve. But then also, so with things like uh, if you've got, trying to get the diet that's right for a patient there there are 
sensitive food sensitivities there's obviously allergies which we know about which give people anaphylaxis and they're quite easy to pick up because you eat food and you get sick straight away but food sensitivities tend to have a more delayed onset and a little bit more insidious can actually cause huge sort of widespread symptoms that people don't pick up on um so food sensitivity and then chemical sensitivity so you can actually be sensitive to chemicals within foods and quite a wide array of chemicals um, and there's no test for these so there's a test for sensitivities but it's really not very accurate and it's better to do elimination and challenge if you're looking for for, uh, for chemical sensitivity you don't do any tests you work with the patient very carefully to understand how they're reacting to what kind of foods and then you make an educated guess and then you try removing that chemical and see if they get better or not. And sometimes it's spectacular and other times you go, well, it's not that, let's move on. So it's really much about trialing things and then waiting to see what the patient response is. But the difference in terms of the safety margin that we have in functional medicine. So what I'm doing is working with diet to optimize it for a patient. I'm not giving them a trial, uh, like an unproven trial drug to see what happens to them. So actually, in terms of, of safety, what we're doing, even if we don't cure their under, the, the thing that they've, want, they've come to see us to get better, by the time they've come to see us, they're going to be on an amazing anti-inflammatory diet. They're going to have loads of antioxidant support from their, you know, their wide phytonutrients, all the different colors in their diet. They're going to be eating a really good macronutrient balance with fewer carbs and better protein and healthy fats. So even if we don't cure whatever it is that they've come with, they're going to be healthier. They're going to have lower risk of heart disease. They're going to hopefully have their stresses addressed. So our nutritional therapists are not only trained in helping people with their nutrition, but we also offer a range of stress management programs. So from buteco breathing uh, and meditation techniques, heart math, and we'll encourage people to use online programs that are specifically tailored for people with chronic fatigue syndrome to help down-regulate the sympathetic nervous system, up-regulate the parasympathetic nervous system so that we get loss of this fight or flight response going all the time because the body can't heal if it's in this constant stress situation. And a lot of the time, we're not aiming to cure a specific symptom. We're aiming to undo the causes, like you said at the beginning, of that symptom and allow the body to heal itself. And so... If we think about somebody with palpitations, there are about 10 different things we can do for somebody with palpitations. And rather than try one of them at a time, we just do them all. Because it doesn't matter, because they're all going to be healthy things to do. And, and the palpitations go away, and then we go, okay, well, we don't know which one of those helped. But to be honest, it doesn't matter. Because um, not, we're not trying to prescribe a medication that's ongoing. They've just learned a healthy set of lifestyle measures dietary changes maybe some nutritional supplementation so with palpitations specifically sort of magnesium making sure their potassium magnesium balance is good making sure that you know they're not eating foods that are high in stimulants and sometimes these things can make a huge difference and it means somebody doesn't have to live a life on beta blockers which have other side effects um for people so sometimes we can take people off medication safely other times we work alongside the medication that they're already on it really depends on the patient and, and the, the circumstances. So yes, there are fewer guidelines because we're not going, this is the symptom, this is the pill for that symptom. We're going, this is the symptom. What are the causes of that symptom and what are all the things that we could be doing to help support the patient heal themselves? Uh, and I imagine that, well, I don't know, this is a question that because a lot of the kind of recommendations you're making you know, are going to involve lifestyle changes or may, many of them sounds like, you know, in terms of nutrition or perhaps, you know, exercise and, and, and so on. Do your patients then need sort of ongoing support and guidance for, for, for implementing those changes? Because sometimes that sort of habit change can be quite difficult for people. So that, that is a big issue. Um, and that's why we have the nutritional therapist team um, alongside. And we will often, so... Uh, if, I, if we want somebody that's a new, uh, like a movement specialist or someone who's really good with rehab, then we would outsource that because we don't have that expertise in the clinic uh, at the moment. So uh, most of our patients will see a doctor, so myself or Dr. Davidson, for an initial consultation. 
we'll think about the whole case, give them an initial treatment plan just to be working towards with the nutritional therapist. So they'll have a couple of consultations while they're waiting for their test results. So we'll, we'll order some tests and then we'll see them two to three months later once they've done some initial treatment plan, they've got the test results. We'll go through it, see how they've responded to the initial treatment plan and then fine tune everything or sometimes do huge U-turns. Sometimes you get, get to the end of doing a diet with somebody and then two months later, they're like, that made me feel worse. So we go, okay, why is that? Do a big U-turn, work it all out and start a new treatment plan. Um, and yes, so our patients get three nutritional therapist appointments built into that with two doctor appointments built into our new patient plan, but they can book more support at any time. Um, we also offer sort of little sort of 15 to 30 minute sort of extra chats if it's needed. Um, and I would happily outsource to kind of other functional medicine providers if I felt that there was somebody with more expertise uh, out there. And we often use like online programs. So for stress management, I, I really have a couple of, of programs that I really enjoy using with, with patients that I find really effective. Um, so it's making it accessible. And, and I think over time, what I've learned is that I have this tendency to go, wow, this is, these are all the problems and this is, these are the 20 things I want you to go away and do to fix it, which of course is just overwhelming <laughs> for a new patient because I get all excited about all the, all the things that we can do at once. So, so it's really about, so my job is to put down all the things that might help and then the nutritional therapist, who is the, the kind of the guide um, for the treatment plan, goes, okay, well, Dr. Sarah says this, but let's just start with this, this, and this. So we usually have this key three things to do before your next appointment, which will typically be sort of three to four months away. Um, and it's just so just finding three things. And if that doesn't work, then get back to us and we'll think of something else that's going to work a bit differently. And if the nutritional supplements that we've suggested make you feel funny or kind of give you heartburn or something and get back to us and we'll think about it again. So it's about this constant fine tuning. Um, but we never do one thing at a time. I think What's really important to understand is that we're getting minimal, multiple small gains from lots of areas. So we're trying to reduce inflammation in multiple ways. We're trying to reduce sympathetic drive in multiple ways. Um, and, and that approach is very different from the reductionist approach that ends up in one pill in general practice. And I think if what we're talking about today is, a lot, is about brain health, I think this is a really, really perfect um, paradigm to discuss both prevention of deterioration in cognitive health and also um, when we're treating people with cognitive decline or Alzheimer's disease. Um, because if you've got somebody whose brain isn't working properly for whatever reason, it's it, you don't just want to put one pill in and hope for the best you do everything that you can to support the whole system to kind of support the brain support cognitive function because one of the things that the body will do if it's challenged or if it doesn't have enough energy is it will sustain functions that it deems are most important so it will keep your blood pressure going and it will keep your digestive system running and it'll allow you to walk up and down to the bathroom or whatever, but it's not going to allow you to think clearly. So people get brain fog as like one of these global early signs of energy dysfunction. So like inability to produce enough energy in a day will give a lot of people brain fog. It's really odd. Some people will get like physical fatigue before they get mental fatigue, but generally most people will notice that their, their thinking shuts down before they notice the physical fatigue starting up. Um, and of course, when you're getting these symptoms, you just support everything that's going on in the, in the body. Um, and so the, our protocols for people with Alzheimer's disease, for instance, will be very, very big treatment programs. You've got somebody who has got um, a real issue going on if they've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So you try and put everything in as fast as possible, as, as fast as the patient can tolerate it and as fast as the, their sort of support system can, can bear. Yeah, and what does, it, what does that look like? So, for as you as you brought it up, so um, when you're trying to support someone with with someone with, with with cognitive decline, I mean, first of all, I, I imagine most of the time you're seeing people and they already have 
symptoms you know that's typically why someone will, 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 will go to a doctor so at that point if they do have symptoms of cognitive decline what's what, what's the approach that you're that you're taking we get both we have both oh you have both okay so so yeah we have both so we have um patients who come who've got family history of alzheimer's disease in two generations and they've been and screened themselves using over-the-counter genetic screening and they've found that they've got an increased risk of alzheimer's disease for instance and they will come to us going what can i do to prevent myself getting alzheimer's disease we get patients coming along going i've been diagnosed with early mild cognitive impairment how can i make it not get any better and then we get the very very far end which is people bringing along their mother or father saying they've got severe dementia how can we make them better and there are there's a point at which so I, what the, the people we really want to see are the people who come along going I've got a really big risk factor but I'm a fine so we want to see pre-symptomatic patients obviously first you know what can I do about that the early patients they're the ones that we can get the most benefit with and then the patients at the far end because what we're asking is wholesale change in diet, lifestyle, and, and maybe, you know, taking quite a few supplements, maybe trying to do uh, some, some cognitive exercises. It has to be driven by the patient. And what I will often say to families is if the patient themselves doesn't understand why we're doing this or feels unhappy with the treatments that we're recommending, then maybe it isn't for them. So it's really, it has to be very, very much guided by the patient if we're using um, these big protocols for um, um, Alzheimer's disease, say. So we we model um, our treatment plans on the work of Dr. Dale Bredesen. So I don't know if you've come across his, he's got a lovely book called End of Alzheimer's. And he's he's written, you know, he's, he's published studies showing reversal of cognitive decline in hundreds of patients and you know what really floors me and and what is very frustrating as a functional medicine practitioner is that large by and large our results are not believed and um, that the medical community doesn't want to hear the, about the work that we're doing because it's not a pill so that every time some alzheimer's pill comes on the market that might show a glimmer of hope it's all over the papers but a guy writes a paper very convincingly showing that he has reduced cognitive decline in 100 patients and nobody's heard of it. I just, I find it staggering and it's, it's, it's not believing. And he's, you know, an amazing, well-respected uh, academic in America. Um, his, his, his research is impeccable and he lectures all over the world. But yet, no, you know, outside of functional medicine, no one has heard of the Bredesen Protocol. So just to put into perspective what a Bredesen Protocol would look like, it's not for the faint-hearted. So <laughs> the very first thing that we would do is screen somebody for all of the possible key changes that he will flag up as risks for cognitive decline. So we start off by looking for sources of inflammation. So inflammation is a big key um, to damage in the body, but also especially if we're, if we're getting inflammation in the brain, that needs to stop as soon as possible. So we go looking for inflammation that is due to infection. We would go looking for inflammation that's due to food sensitivity. Um, in my practice as a whole, actually, the older generation have much fewer food sensitivities than my generation, my children's generations. So we're seeing huge amounts of food sensitivities uh, further down. But we do go looking for them in these older patients because they're nice, low-hanging fruit. If you can stop dairy say causing horrible reflux and digestive symptoms all the time sometimes that's amazing um so we we look at the diet and then we want to take it away from the pro-inflammatory high carb nasty trans fat western diet and we want to make that into a really really low inflammatory high micronutrient high nutrient density um modified mediterranean diet so that's where we would start so we do elimination we get into a modified mediterranean diet and then what we want to do after that is achieve some, some way of therapeutically allowing the brain to heal. So we'll talk about diet again in a little bit. So we look at inflammation. The next bit we want to look at is glycation or sugar. So if somebody has 
raised blood sugars this is one of or metabolic syndrome this is one of the key indicators that their brain won't be able to heal and they're going to have ongoing extra inflammation specifically from this metabolic syndrome process so one of the very first things that we do is reduce sugars um and that will go not only to just a modified Mediterranean diet, which is moderately low carb, but we would also go into a therapeutic ketogenic diet. So if you've got a brain that is dysfunctional, um, Dr. Bredesen's work has shown that one of the really important things that you want to do is allow the brain to start healing again. And it will do that even in very old patients um, and you can get brain remodeling. You can see the brain growing if you're in ketosis, which is an amazing thing. We didn't think that the brain could heal in old people. But he's shown, you know, on these uh, MRI scans um, temporal lobes regrowth in a ketogenic diet. It helps produce a chemical called brain derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. You only get that when you're in this therapeutic ketosis. And so with all of our patients with cognitive decline, we start off by cleaning up the diet, making anti-inflammatory, and then looking for therapeutic ketosis. Some patients, before you can go into therapeutic ketosis, you need to actually correct their micronutrient deficiencies because actually to do that, you need good levels of B2, B3, carnitine, B12. You need good thyroid hormone support to burn fat in the mitochondria, which are the little batteries that power the cells. You need to make sure that your hormones are in line as well. So sometimes we do a little bit of work before we go into ketosis, getting people's hormones right. So we've done inflammation, we've looked at sugar. The next thing we would look at is, is hormone balance. So in women especially, one of the things that we that Dr. Bredesen has noted is that very you know low-dose HRT, so small replacements of estrogen, we often just use a, a vaginal pessary, which actually is really good for kind of if people have got urinary incontinence that's maybe waking them at night. It sometimes serves a dual purpose, so they sleep better through the night because they're not getting up to wee all the time. And that little bit of estrogen allows the brain to start repairing itself again. And then we look very, very carefully at thyroid hormone, how it's been metabolized, because low lyothyronine, which is the active T3 hormone, um, has been very, very closely correlated with cognitive decline. And you want to make sure that somebody's thyroid, not only that the thyroid is working properly, but that the body is able to metabolize the inactive thyroid hormone to the active thyroid hormone. And sometimes we would think about replacing very tiny doses of the active thyroid hormone to get the balance better for cognitive function. Um, and then there's also, the one of the other risk factors is obviously brain injury from trauma. There's not a lot we can do about it if it's already happened, but at least to acknowledge whether that's an issue. Um, and we'd also have a look at toxicity so we're not only talking about Alzheimer's disease with brain health, but things like Parkinson's disease. I've, I've got a patient who went, went to the clinic uh, with his Parkinsonism. So he had some tremors the other day and they walked in and he's, he's been a farmer his entire life. And they went, oh, you've got farmer's disease. Because we know that these people who are exposed to huge doses of agricultural chemicals, um, heavy metal toxins uh, for long periods of time are much more likely to develop um, neurological problems so he the heavy metals that we know are associated are copper so everybody got rid of their copper pans aluminium everyone got rid of their aluminium pans but mercury there's really good papers recently showing the, the link between alzheimer's disease and mercury exposure so when we think about one of the things we do is stop people eating tuna <laughs> now you see somebody with 10 dental amalgams eating tuna three, three times a week that mercury burden over a 70 year period is going to be huge so we do think about heavy metals and that's something that's not discussed at all in western medicine but we know that worldwide the who says heavy metal toxicity is a huge huge health problem uh, and you look at people who are drinking uh, say in in pakistan who've got arsenic in the water all the time and the massive impact that that has uh, on a population basis and we think that that doesn't apply to us but actually it does apply to us. We just never go looking for it. So we would think about toxins as well. And then Dale Bredesen also singles out a few other things that we need to think about when we want to repair somebody intensely. So we think about methylation. And methylation is just this process that helps us to rebuild 
DNA and proteins, and it relies on a few micronutrients to be present in sufficient quantity. And it also relies on some genetic processes that in some people are weaker than in other people. So it needs B9, folate, B12, which is really, really commonly uh, low. So one in 20 people over the age of 65 have uh, B12 deficiency. Um, we need magnesium, zinc, and then also betaine and choline. So methylation, this process of healing and repair, if it starts to slow down, will often slow down in aging because of micronutrient deficiency. And so we'll look at somebody who's kind of failing physically or mentally and say, oh, it's just old age. But actually, if you go looking at the nutrient levels in these patients, they're really, really low. And when you replace them, things work better. And, and this is one of the one of the real kind of sadnesses that, you know, when I learned about methylation and started to be really interested in nutrition and doing screening, I realized that the, the nutritional screening and assessments that we do in the NHS are just simply not fit for purpose. They don't allow us to understand what's going on inside people's bodies properly because methylation is so key if you want to heal and repair somebody. So we will use a lot of B12 and, and it's one of the first things that we will think of trying uh, in somebody with cognitive decline. And because the way B12 is absorbed is, is very tricky, it needs a perfect functioning in the stomach and perfect functioning in the end of the small bowel. If anything goes wrong in that system, you've got a patient who simply cannot absorb it, even if they're given a pill. Um, you can try some of these sprays into the side of the mouth or lozenges that go under the tongue, but actually one of the safest and quickest ways to replace it is, is through injections. And what we've seen during COVID, of course, is lots of patients being taken off their B12 injections and being told that taking a pill is okay, when actually it really, really cannot replace the, the instantaneous and, and proper replacement with injections. Um, yeah, so they're the major things that we would think about. And then we would, so we, we look for them and then we go about correcting them. So we're doing micronutrient replacement. We're really fine tuning the diet. We're looking at getting people into therapeutic ketosis, making sure all their hormones are well replaced and, and helping their body to make that conversion between the inactive and the active thyroid hormone with nutritional support. And we'll look at ways of helping people detox as well. And of course, then that all goes alongside stress reduction, improving exercise, exercise. What it's, it's, one of the, it's almost because of the patient list that I deal with, exercise is one of the late, later things that I do because so most of my patients are just too fatigued to do anything. And some of the, you know, most, most of them, it's, I tell them to rest and to save their energy for healing until they're better and then they can start exercising. So when we're thinking about lifestyle plans, sometimes the most important thing I can do is to tell people to pace themselves. Because you'll, as soon as they get that little bit of extra energy, they then spend it doing something uh, that because they're so excited about having extra energy. And then they make themselves unwell for three or four days afterwards because they've overspent energy that they didn't really have the resources to spend. Um, so, yeah, exercise is in there as well. And then sleep. I've talked about sleep. Um, sleep, especially in older people, is one of those things that can be uh, really deficient. So understanding why someone isn't sleeping is really key. Is it is it pain? Is it because they're going to the toilet every two hours? Is it that they just can't settle at night? Are they very anxious? So thinking about why they're not sleeping and then putting um, support in place to help with that. So sometimes that might be a little bit of melatonin support, the natural sleep chemical. Sometimes that's going to be about making sure the bedtime routine is really good. Other times uh, it's going to be about making sure we've replaced B12 and magnesium because that can really help with relaxation. Um, so there's lots, uh, or sometimes I've even used um, desmopressin recently, which is a, so another, another drug I very occasionally might actually ask a GP to use because it, it needs some monitoring. Is um, They've recently licensed desmopressin to stop people who are getting up to wee through the night. And it's a lovely drug. We use it in children who've got nocturnal enuresis, so we wet the bed. And it's quite safe in, even in the elderly, providing you check the sodium levels. And, and that can be really nice to get someone sleeping again. And as I say, the vaginal estrogen pessaries in older women who've got unstable bladders, that can sometimes give them better sleep. So understanding why things happen is really important. Um, 
and then just tailoring the plan and trying other things if if that particular bit doesn't work so medicine protocol is getting your diet right getting your nutritional support right getting your hormonal support right getting your sleep right getting your stress reduced and then working on exercise when you can and then we have the extra element of brain training if somebody is able to do it so there's a really lovely um website called brain hq um which i don't know if you've ever been on it and tried <laughs> tried to do the exercises there are some things which i cannot do um <laughs> <laughs> um so it's it's really it's, it's I, I have a problem with um visu- visualizing things and, and i don't have any visual spatial facial memory at all my, my brain just doesn't work in that way and so i look like i've got <laughs> really bad cognitive decline in some areas and then other areas you know still obviously functional for my brain for whatever reason and and so we've had patients go from less than the 50th centile working through these protocols to I've got a guy who's now I think he's about the 72nd centile and he's gone from below the 50th from just working through this protocol so I've seen it in action I've seen it work um but it's a huge undertaking and the last thing I want to do is have families dragging along a patient who doesn't know why they're there doesn't want to change their diet just wants to have their jam sandwiches and a cup of tea every day or whatever and um, but I'm really, really keen for patients to come at as an early point if they're worried that something is happening to them or they, if somebody's got really good family support, then there are loads of things that we can do. Um, yeah, so, so that's the Bredesen protocol. <laughs> yeah. Beautifully described. So is the, um, I was just thinking of the sort of t- time scales for, you know, as you say, it's, you know, with older perhaps older patients that might be more, you know, might be, you know, more resistance to changing their diet and, and, and so on. What sort of timescales does, does, the, does the protocol kind of operate? It's obviously different for different people. It's different for different people. So I have patients that come and see me and they're already in therapeutic ketosis. They're already taking loads of supplements that they've read about on the internet. They've, they're already doing brain training. So I get, I get really, the lovely thing about my clinic is I have very motivated patients on the whole, apart from the ones that get dragged to see me by a family member. Um, and so if I've got somebody that hasn't made any changes at all to get to the point where I think they've got good hormones, good micronutrient replacement and they're in a ketogenic diet, you're probably looking at about six months to get there. Yeah. And then if you've got more work to do, so all of these patients will have a key weakness that you really want to work on. Um, and so if it's a detox plan, I mean, that could be a couple of years because you, you, you're you going to detox somebody very, very slowly. You don't want to move toxins fast because you'll poison someone all over again. You move toxins very, very slowly. So a slow, slow detox nutritional program with some sauna or whatever else going in there. Um, I think... What I've learned from functional medicine is to be very relaxed, but also hopeful about timescales for things. I have seen people get better over, because I've, I've been running this clinic now for a while, so I've got patients who I first saw five years ago who are still making slow, progressive improvements in their lives. And we don't have time for that in NHS medicine. We give them a pill and if they're not better in two weeks, we stop the pill and go, oh, it's not working. Um, you know, these patients would naturally just decline and be left to kind of gradually get worse and worse. The fact that they're not getting worse, so they stay the same, and then they're gradually getting better. That's amazing and it has to be celebrated. And, and while it looks pathetic to that, you know, NHS doesn't like looking at things that happen slowly. You know, the, the the length of a normal clinical trial is going to be like 12 weeks, maybe a year or something. I'm looking at patients getting better very slowly over, you know, two, three year periods. And that's still OK because they're still healing and that, that takes time. And sometimes they have genetic, you know, weaknesses that you cannot change, but you can learn to work with and find out what works best for them. And there are still patients who I'm just still learning what works best for them. <clears throat> there's no there's often no there's no good guidelines and there's no good advice for some of these conditions and and you are having to sit and work from first principles with that patient about what it is that works for them and what it is that they they can manage to fit in in their lives if they've got severe chronic fatigue 
they can't make wholesale changes overnight because actually the amount of energy and kind of planning it takes to do that is too much. I've got a, a lovely um, uh, lady at the moment who's got um, autism spectrum disorder and to do an elimination diet took her 12 months because she had to learn all of the recipes for the elimination diet properly and learn how to do them because it took so much processing for her to learn new things that that was how long it felt for her to feel that she could do the program properly um, and it's amazing because she's of course now done it absolutely perfectly which nobody else bothers doing but you work with patients at their own pace absolutely it's just that I guess if you've got cognitive decline you want to try and get as much in place at an early stage <clears throat> as possible to try and give the person the best chance of, of recovery and there's never any promises um but but you just you do your best at all points with these patients i imagine that there's two there's education will have to be a big part of your kind of protocols as well in kind of two ways one in that trying to educate people you know this, this is going to be a different approach to the traditional medical approach of a sticky plaster and trying to you know fix things very 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 quickly but also particularly with alzheimer's disease and, and dementia that you know there's a, a general view that it can't be treated you can't you know that it's not possible to prevent this disorder so i imagine i don't it's a question but you know i do you have patients coming along clients coming along patients coming along who don't really believe in the notion that you know you can actually you know prevent and in some cases even reverse alzheimer's yes yeah so so the the but but they tend not to invest in coming to my clinic um if they don't believe they're going to get better but oh, interestingly i have a a guy and his wife have both got cognitive decline at the moment she's really into functional medicine and wants to change the diet and her husband has signed up for a clinical trial and i don't think he's that keen so it's just one of those it, and you know they're both medical as well so he's obviously, you know, he's been taught that there's nothing you can do about it, yeah? Whereas she's like, yeah, but but there's all this new data that says you can be helped. And, and so it, it depends where the patient's coming from. I think with Alzheimer's disease, if you've got a diagnosis, you've got to really want to do a medicine protocol. You've got to be bought into it. You've got to have read about it and decided that's what you want for you. What I find really distressing, actually, especially when I'm working, so I've just finished working in the NHS sort of four or five months ago, and I've finished, but I, I've worked, you know, like I said, I think it's about 16 years. I'm not sure it's 18. Uh, maybe it is that long now. I can't count it. Um, if the patients that come to me, so young patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, and they believe, they've been told that they can't be helped. And that, that really upset me, actually, as part of the reason why I, I left the NHS, is because they actually you can say to them, well, actually, there might be things you could do and they're, they're completely helpless and hopeless and they don't believe you. Uh, and to be honest, nor sometimes do they want to embark on something else that they're going to be disappointed by. Um, and and that, that was, that's a really hard lesson for me and, and why I didn't want to carry on having 10-minute appointments because I, I tend to, when I work in a practice, and I've got these amazing colleagues where I was working before who would send me all of the problem cases. So they'd all be working their way through cough, cold, anxiety, and I would be working my way through chronic fatigue patients, patients with awful gut problems that nobody could solve that had all, all kind of ended up on my patient list and all with 10-minute appointments. And it would just knowing that given more time and resources I could be able to might be able to help them but given the toolkit that I had and the 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 kind of the time that I had just finding that really really challenging and so from the perspective of where I'm working now looking at my colleagues still working at the coalface in general practice with acute medicine you know there is no criticism of what they are doing now because they they don't have these toolkits that I have, they don't have the tests that I have, they don't have the time and a nutritional therapy backup. They haven't got 90 minutes plus another 90 minutes with a nutritionist that understands what I'm talking about. Um, they simply cannot provide a functional medicine service. And, and I know that those of us who are kind of working in this field and people like Rong and Chatterjee, for instance, are really keen on trying to educate the next generation of doctors that there is another kind of medicine, but it just doesn't exist at the moment uh, in medical training but that if we can start to 
get these two different kinds of medicine. So there's preventative and chronic disease management medicine versus the acute medicine. They are two completely different fields of medicine and they need to run side by side because you can't have 10 minute appointments with chronic disease management. It's it's not. I mean, we've been saying this for decades as GPs. It's not fit for purpose, but it's what we've got because it's the only the resource of time is not something we have a great deal of in the NHS. Um, yeah, so there's, so there are lots of things that need to be improved, but at the moment we are, you know, firefighting as far as, as general practice is concerned, and that's that's what my colleagues have to do. Yeah. Are there other aspects of brain health, you know, that are particularly amenable to functional medicine as well? So we'll typically deal with neurological disease. So we'll, we'll take on patients with MS and we'll take on patients with cognitive decline or dementia. We'll think about patients with Parkinson's. MS, for example, is that, that that's, you're working with MS because it's a particularly sort of intractable disorder, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I have seen patients really, really stabilise to the point that you can't tell that they've got MS. I've seen patients who've gone back for scans after working with us and having nothing on their scans. Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, really. Um, and I think that MS is not one disease necessarily. I don't think it's, it's, it's the end. And like, like Alzheimer's disease, it's the end result of problems in metabolism usually to do with and then there's, there's an autoimmune component and there's often a toxic component as well so ms is one of those disorders that um can respond to functional medicine in some patients i mean with with autoimmunity in general so i actually will we'll, we'll think about ms alongside the rest of my autoimmune patients it just happens to be an autoimmune disease which is affecting the brain and Parkinson's is an interesting one because we know it's probably got aspects of autoimmunity. It's definitely got aspects of toxicity, like my pharma patient who's who's been exposed to huge amounts of toxins through his life. Um, and there are also complex genetics at play. And some people, there's a very, very strong genetic predisposition to autoimmunity. So when we think about folate methylation disorders, so these are patients that are born metabolizing vitamin B9 very slowly and they are more likely to have slow methylation so that their repair mechanisms are not as good they're much more likely to get autoimmunity and ms is just one of the autoimmune diseases they may get so i get patients with two three four autoimmune diseases so i'd had about three autoimmune diseases by the time i was 30 and i just have this predisposition for for kind of attacking my own um my own body with my own uh, immune system and that's because I have a folate methylation disorder as well. Yeah, yeah. So I, so so people actually ask me, is that why you got into functional medicine? And actually, no, it's not at all. <laughs> it's because my brain works a little bit differently. So um, yeah, so I've I've had arthritis since I was in my mid-teens. I've got autoimmune thyroid disease, and when I was nineteen, when I was at med school, I developed Guillain-Barré syndrome, which is a, a paralyzing uh, neurological condition. Um, which I developed after flu. So two weeks after I had the flu virus, I then became paralysed from the hands and feet inwards, which was an interesting... Do you know, I, you know, every doctor should be... Everyone, every doctor should be ill at some point and experience what it's like to be on the sharp end of medicine because it's made me <clears throat> really, really empathise with what happens to people when they go into hospital and that complete loss of, of control... And um, yeah, so so being a patient is is really really interesting, and and it makes you you realise the deficiencies that are in the system. You know, we all love the NHS, and we're all glad that it's there, and it saved my life. If we hadn't had immunoglobulin therapy, I suspect I would have died of of Guillain-Barré at ninety. You know, so it it did save my life. But <clears throat> the reason that I've been developing all of these autoimmune conditions is because my body doesn't heal itself properly um, because of presumably toxicity. So my mum, bless her, is a dentist and, you know, had huge amounts of mercury exposure when I was, before I was born. And there are all of these things that probably have added up to the way that I've become unwell. But I also think that 
there is something about the way that my neurotransmitters are produced and broken down, which is very strongly associated with how your methylation system works. That means that I think slightly differently. So I'm kind of really geeky and quite analytical and I love biochemistry. And I think that's part, that's, I think that's why I became a functional medicine doctor is because I don't like having challenges presented to me that I can't solve. And that's why I went away looking for something else where most, most doctors are quite happy to kind of just do what they're told in the guidelines. And when there are things that they can't deal with, they go, well, we can't deal with it. That's fine. Whereas my brain just goes, no, that's really wrong. I need to need to find out the answers to that one as well. Um, so I suspect that's, that's really why I became a functional medicine doctor is that my brain is a bit, a bit special. Yeah. I was going to, going to ask you actually that because, because you're, um, I think I know the answer to this actually now is that I, have you adopted a lot of the kind of lifestyle practices, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the functional medicine practices that you, that you suggest and offer to your patients in your own life? Absolutely. And you wouldn't be an authentic functional medicine doctor if you didn't do it. So um, autoimmune paleo diet has revolutionized my life. I am healthier now at 40 than I was at 20. Um, not eating gluten got rid of my arthritis for good. Uh, I don't have arthritis anymore. Um, I'm also sensitive to dairy and soy um, and it made a big difference to my children as well so both my children have inherited some of my food sensitivities and them not having those has made a big difference to them um, I have typically a, a low carb diet and I intermittently go keto when my husband supports me because I'm quite bad at concentrating on what I eat because I work a lot um, so so yeah we have keto diet home we have elimination everything's organic in the house we filter all our water we have clean cleaning products we so we we yeah we walk the walk and but to me now that just feels normal because I've been doing it for so long but there are always improvements that you can make you notice that you're getting a bit lazy with your diet or that you're skipping uh you're skipping meals which actually I will do I'll skip breakfast anyway as part of sort of intermittent fasting which is something else you can do for brain health um but but there's always things where you think actually I could be doing a little bit more and stress reduction so as as doctors with really busy lives stress management is one of those things that sometimes I don't feel I have time to to do to take care of myself so learning that I have to prioritize my own stress management and I have to prioritize exercise is like it's a big thing so we've we've moved house recently we've got a climbing wall in the in the barn outside and that's been really nice because I've been climbing since I was sort of six seven but suddenly we've got a facility outside that I can do training on which was, was primarily for my husband I'm actually a very very shoddy rock climber um <laughs> but there's there's no excuse not to go and do some exercise now. so it's really nice and kind of just just doing all of that myself yeah so I do. I walk the walk as well as talk the talk. <laughs> and, and you've got to try these things. So you've got to know what you're putting patients through. A big elimination diet, which will take up to eight weeks of your life, uh, is, a, is a big thing to do. So um, twice a year, we run online courses where we do elimination diets online with people. And I'll do it again. With <laughs> So I'll go through the elimination process again with those patients online and you know sometimes I just pick things up that I hadn't realized so this year I've just done it recently and I've been through and I realized that potatoes just don't make don't don't really agree with me but I hadn't picked that up before because I don't eat a lot of potatoes anyway because I'm typically low carb but when I put them back in I was like okay yeah probably shouldn't be eating those um yeah so we do a lot of that at home and, and and so nobody can accuse me of telling them to do something that I wouldn't do myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's honestly like inspirational the work the, the work that you're doing is so 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 important. So where can people find out more about your clinic and the, and the work that you're doing? So um our clinic we've got a, a website which is um drsarahdavis.co.uk. If you want to find out more about the Bredesen uh, protocol, I really recommend Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's, if that is something that, that is, you know, close to your heart. Um, reading his work, uh, it was one of those kind of turning points in my life. I sort of sat on a plane with his book and sort of saved it till I was going on holiday. I just remember sitting on this plane with tears streaming down my face thinking, 
here is a man who's found a way of helping people. And even if it doesn't help everybody, it's a way of helping people. And it's just so sad that it's not, it isn't available. And then feeling like, okay, well, I've got to make, I've got to make this available. And there's only one of me. Um, so at the moment, one of my, one of the big things I know I need to do is actually expand our clinic because we've had such huge demand especially over over covid because we went online we our, our whole clinic went online because we had to because we couldn't do face to face and we're now cqc registered as an online clinic so i've taken on one new doctor but i think in the new year we're going to change our structure a little bit and i'm going to spend more time training new doctors so that functional medicine can be made a, a, kind of available to more patients yeah amazing with that Thank you so much for spending time with me today, Sarah. It really is fascinating to hear about the work that you're doing in functional medicine and the benefits for brain health and cognitive decline. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. You're very welcome. It's been really lovely talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.